Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. GSMC Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Shredder, and this podcast is brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Thank you again for tuning into the program. I really appreciate it. We at GSMC definitely appreciate you guys tuning in. Wow. What a weekend in sports, but also just think about it, though. What a Amazing, amazing run by Gonzaga and Baylor to get to this point of the fact that Baylor wins its national championship and reaches the glory of great teams in NCAA basketball. The theme of my podcast today is going to revolve around the world word resilience. And the reason why resilience is, I think, the appropriate theme for this podcast today is because I think it describes Baylor basketball to a T. Baylor, as everyone knows, absolutely blew out Gonzaga. Gonzaga, everyone thought, for the most part, they were going to win the national championship. That didn't happen. Baylor won 86-70. to They just physically dominated Gonzaga. And before I get into why Baylor revolves around the word resilience, I want to take a minute just to address something that I heard recently that I think is getting completely blown out of context. Gonzaga is not an overrated team. They ran into a better team in Baylor that had better athletes and a better defensive game plan to deal with Gonzaga's offense. Gonzaga was a fantastic team. They beat teams like Iowa. They beat teams like West Virginia. They beat teams like Kansas. They were an excellent team, an excellent team. I understand people want to play down them because they didn't play in a strong conference, but they beat a bunch of power fives to get to this point. They beat Oklahoma. They beat USC. They beat Creighton. They beat UCLA. They are a very good basketball team. Okay, so let's not look at the fact that they are definitely, they were definitely the number two team in the country. Okay, so just because Baylor blew them out, Baylor was played unbelievable and Baylor was the better team. And I have to admit that because I thought Gonzaga was going to win that game. doesn't mean Gonzaga is overrated. It just means that from that game, you look at Baylor and say, if that team played Gonzaga 10 times, they'd probably win eight of those games. They were just a better team based on how it worked. And you can go through the statistics, right? I think the statistics definitely prove a lot of things. But my major takeaways were a few different things, right? If you look at Baylor's ball screen offense, right? And I think from a, from a lot of people who don't watch the game as closely as maybe I do because I'm a basketball player, I think you really should have looked at their ball screen offense. They got so many open looks on rolls to the basket for their big guys and Jonathan Chamba Chachua, Flo Thamba, Mark Vital, right? These guys were just getting easy looks in pick and roll situations because of the, of the superb offensive game plan that Scott Drew put together, and also the superb play of the guards of Baylor to get to that point of running great ball screen offense. And when you think about resilience, right, you think of overcoming adversity. And you only overcome adversity if you're the tougher team, if you have a mental toughness and a physical toughness about you. And if you look at Baylor, they won every 50-50 ball against Gonzaga. Any steal, they got it. Any loose ball, they got it. Any rebound, they basically got it, right? They won the rebounding battle 38-22, to which, again, in basketball, it's all about being the tougher team. Like, think about it, guys, right? If you 
want to win, right? You got to have, like I've said this many times, when teams have upset teams in the NCAA tournament, when teams are getting to the championship, it comes down to belief, game plan, and execution, right? But that game plan and execution is important. But if you don't do the little things to win, and you're not the tougher team, you don't handle adversity correctly, you could have the greatest game plan in the world. But if you don't handle adversity when it's thrown at you, you're not going to be able to be a great team. And Baylor was the tougher team. They fought with whenever Gonzaga made a run to cut it to 10 or 9 points. They always answered with a huge run because they were resilient, because they've been resilient all year. And the third point I want to make is that the reason why Baylor is so talented is because their guards found mismatches and took advantage of that. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that when you take advantage of your of your mismatches, a lot of times they would use ball screen offense to get a switch, which means they have a big guy on a guard that can create his own shot. And creating your own shot is so important, especially in the NBA ba- uh, world, but in college basketball, basketball too, because if you have, in Baylor's case, they have five guys who can create their own shot. Davion Mitchell, Jared Butler, Macy Oteague, Adam Flagler, and Matt Meyer. They all can create their own shot, which is extremely, extremely important. And if you look at what Baylor was able to accomplish, they got those screens, they got those mismatches, and those guards took advantage of any time any time that Watson was on them and Drew Timmy was on them. And if you look at that, even uh, Corey Kispert, right? Anytime those guys were on them, they took advantage of that matchup and really made it difficult for Gonzaga to make runs because they always answered with great offense and getting those mismatches. And let's also take a look at how important, I think there's a few other points you can definitely make, right? I think that the defense of Baylor was unbelievable. I think one of the best defensive jobs I have ever seen out of any team. And I think for a lot of basketball fans, this is how teams in college win, right? Look, they have to have talent on the offensive end. They have to have a good coach and a good game plan, but they have to play extremely good defense, force turnovers. And that's what they did. They took the ball from Gonzaga. They were tougher, right? They crushed them on the glass, 38 to 22. Mark Vital had more, had almost as many offensive rebounds as the entire Gonzaga team had total offensive rebounds. And the point I'm saying is with defense, it's not just rebounding, right? Because rebounding, everyone thinks that. No, it's ball pressure. If you make Gonzaga get out of their offense, if those handoffs aren't able to happen, if you're not able to run your offense with efficiency because you're getting pushed off the line, because you're getting pressured and you have to go to your third, fourth, and fifth option, that's what Baylor wanted you to do. And Baylor sped them up too quickly where they were out of control and couldn't make the right plays. And that allowed Baylor to really take full advantage of Gonzaga and actually take control of the game. That was a defensive clinic. And that's really where you go there. And I think what's important too is the fact that the rebounding was 38-22 to by Baylor. That Baylor also outscored Gonzaga by 15 points from the three-point line. And that all comes down to, yes, a game plan. But it comes down to the fact that Baylor is resilient. Baylor has a toughness about him. Baylor has a good culture about him. Not saying Gonzaga doesn't have that. But if you watched that game and didn't think that Baylor was a bunch of football guys who can actually play basketball, that's what we saw. And, and there was supposedly a uh, thing I heard that Baylor was even lifting with the football guys because it looked, they, they were just built like that, right? Those guys just hit the weight room like no other. Mark Vital is 6'5", 250, and can jump almost near 40 inches. Flo Thamba and Jonathan Chabachachua can also jump to the roof. Well, especially Chaba Chachua. Flo Fama is also a very good athlete. He's very physical. Chaba Chachua is 6'9". He can just jump all over the gym. And that helps Baylor because they can l- rely on those guys from a rebounding and defensive standpoint. They don't have to rely about the, on them so much offensively because they have five guys who can put the ball on the ground and get a bucket. And that when you have that, when you have that ability to do that, you put yourself in prime position to be a very successful team. And think about it. If there wasn't the COVID pause... Baylor might have been undefeated going into this championship game and may have had an undefeated season. And this is not taking anything away from Gonzaga's because the thing is, whenever you have a bad situation, you can always learn from it. You can always hit the positives out of this season. Corey Kispert said it best in his post-game interview. But Baylor was truly remarkable. They were just better. Point and simple. Just a better team. Right? Just a better team. And I don't want to hear people say, oh, well, Gonzaga had an off night and Gonzaga was tired from UCLA. No, it's about resilience, right? 
Baylor was resilient. Baylor had four guys transfer in recently, right? Davion Mitchell was an Auburn transfer. Chaba Chachua went from UNLV to Baylor. Macy Oteague went to Baylor from UNC Asheville. Adam Flagger came from Presbyterian. And even Jared Butler, who was at Alabama, then also went to Baylor. If you think about all this stuff, right, it's resilience. These guys were resilient. They worked on their craft. They listened to their coach. And they got better. And they built a culture of winning, right? They had 18 more shot attempts, right? They had Davion Mitchell at 15. Jared Butler at 22. Macy Otiga at 19. They crushed Gonzaga on the boards. And it's, this is not just about listing off stats for you guys. It's about the idea of being resilient. And the fact is, when you transfer into a school and you stay diligent with your craft, when you build a good culture and you're resilient enough to overcome a COVID pause where you struggled for a little bit in Big 12 play and then you dominate everyone in the NCAA tournament, that's resilience. That's belief. That's overcoming adversity, which in sports everyone knows is super critical to becoming a successful team. And I don't think it's rocket science at all that this happens. Now, I don't think that I was surprised about how much they dominated Gonzaga. But this just shows me that when you have a physical team, when you are more athletic than the guys playing against you, and you have the resilience and the skill around you, you can beat anyone. And Baylor's defense on the ball was unbelievable. I referenced when they played Villanova, right? Villanova just got absolutely dominated in the second half by getting the ball taken away from them, by getting pressured and making turnovers and bad decisions. And Villanova is one of the best teams in the country at assist to turnover ratio. And they are so good, you should have taken care of the ball. Same thing with Gonzaga. But Gonzaga's issue came down to the fact they just got beaten up and, and were not as athletic and too slow on the perimeter to stand, except for maybe Jared Suggs. Sorry, Jalen Suggs, excuse me. And besides Jalen Suggs, who's an unbelievable athlete, if you look at the different matchups, Gonzaga was too slow. They were too slow. Suggs could, could guard those guys, but you can't rely on one defender to be great for you. Drew Timmy, good athlete. But those guys in Baylor are just incredible athletes. It's not Gonzaga's fault. I'm not, these guys are more athletic than a lot of the teams they play, and they're more properly executed in terms of how they prepare, how they execute their offense, how they move without the ball, how they get mismatches. But Baylor was is just so athletic and quick and good with their hands and great defensively and has a tenacity about them. And again, they're resilient, right? They overcame adversity. They overcame transfer uh, transfers into the school. They overcame a COVID pause. They overcame their coach getting COVID early in the year. They overcame guys that were not regarded as highly ranked transfers coming in and becoming Big 12 and All-American type players. This is the, the point I make about resiliency. And if you look at this, that, look, Butler was recruited by Alabama, right? He was the 98th recruit in his 2017 class. You look at Teague and Mitchell, right? Good players out of high school, but Teague went to UNC Asheville. He wasn't recruited by the by the big-time programs. Davion Mitchell recruited to Auburn, very good program, but played behind Jared Harper, who's now in the NBA. So you look at all this kind of stuff, they were resilient. They worked through that fact that they were doubted and not looked on as highly as some of the other guys in their class. And they proved everyone wrong. That's what's so cool about all of this, right? You love those stories when a guy overcomes not being regarded as highly as some other recruits and then figuring it out at the end, right? That's what basketball is all about. That's what makes basketball so special. And you do that, you adopt that kind of philosophy. It makes things so interesting down the road. And let's even just take a fact to look at like what Scott Drew has accomplished, right? In his 18 years, in 2003, there was a whole criminal investigation into Baylor, and their program was falling apart. And if you look at the, at the way that he's taken that program from the bottom end of the Big 12 Conference to the top end of the Big 12 Conference, it, it's unbelievable what he's done. And that's staying resilient. He had seven active players and then had to play six six or seven walk-ons in his first season as a head coach because they didn't have enough bodies under scholarship. And he had to, when they were 30-point underdogs against certain teams and losing by 30, he had to build that resiliency and that toughness within himself and his team in order to overcome that and say, we're not going to be doubted by the people around us. And people were doubting them against Gonzaga, right? I was one of the people that didn't necessarily doubt them. I thought they were going to lose in a close game. 
But they, they proved everyone wrong. They had the right players and the right scheme and everything like that. And that's a credit to Scott Drew and his resiliency. Because if your coach has a resiliency about him, if he has a toughness about him, if he has the intelligence and the smarts to execute a proper game plan, sky's the limit. If you ask me, sky's the limit to be successful. And I'm not sitting here saying that I predicted this whole thing by Baylor. Because I didn't. I didn't predict and think that, and I don't think a lot of people predicted that this would this would turn out to be this much of a blowout. But what this is great about, it's a great basketball story. And a great basketball stories come down with resilience. And if you look at the resilience of Baylor, it just, it, again, it just proves a bigger point. And it proves a point of the fact that, you know, these guys weren't recruited by, necessarily all these guys recruited by big time blue bloods, right? And they didn't get a chance to have great success at their first schools. But they found Baylor, they found Scott Drew, they found each other, they believed in each other, believed in the coach, believed in Baylor basketball, and got the job done. And that's being resilient, right? If you have COVID pauses, if you're not, your school's not working out the first time, they stayed resilient. They're like, I'm going to prove everyone wrong. And that's such a cool story. That, that's what basketball is all about at the end of the day. And that's why I love I love basketball as just a sport to play and a sport to talk about because I love hearing about players who overcame the odds. It's just such a cool story. And Baylor has guys who did that and did that at a high level. And what's also cool too is the fact that they didn't look what unfortunately due to the fact that COVID came upon us and there was no NCAA tournament last year, they didn't have a chance to, they were going to be a number one seed and they didn't have a chance to compete for a national championship. And they could have been in that picture, but what they ultimately did is they didn't take that as a negative. They were saying in Gonzaga was the same way. They didn't take it as a negative. They worked harder. They built the chemistry up from that season, got better, fought through COVID pauses, fought through struggles in the Big 12 that they had against Kansas and against Oklahoma State, where they didn't play their greatest in that later stretch of the Big 12. But they stayed diligent. They stayed resilient. They stayed confident in one another. And that allowed them to be one of the better teams we've seen in recent memory. Look at a team like Villanova when they beat Georgetown back in the 1980s, like 1986, right? Think about that championship. Right, Bill Nova wasn't thought to be able to beat a more talented Georgetown team, but they stayed resilient. They fought through all the adversity that they had to face. They believed in each other. They were confident. Raleigh Massimino got them to that chance to win that championship. This is what college basketball is all about, guys. Right? This is all it's all about. This is what basketball is all about. Right? Look at a uh, look at a situation like here's a good situation being resilient. When LeBron James came back from a 3-1 deficit against the Warriors in 2016 and won the NBA championship. he Guys could have given up that situation. Oh, we're down 3-1. We got no chance. But no, LeBron stayed resilient. He stayed diligent. He fought through that adversity and they won the championship. Baylor fought through those COVID, COVID positives, fought through being doubted, and fought through people saying, you know, they might not make the Final Four. And they, they're probably not going to win a championship. Illinois is going to be there before them and all that stuff, right? They fought through all of that and blew out Gonzaga in the championship game. A very good Gonzaga team, mind you. Not an overrated one like everyone thinks they are. No, they were just the better team because they had a toughness about them. They were unbelievable defensively. They were resilient and they had a great coach who had a great game plan. Simple as that, right? Scott Drew building Baylor from the bottom to being the, the national champion and being a contending team in his 18 years, that's unbelievable. That's so cool, right? That is just a great thing. And then building players who, again, weren't recruited by those top blue bloods, right? Weren't regarded as the top NBA prospects. Jalen Suggs, Corey Kispert were higher ranked NBA prospects than Davion Mitchell, Jared Butler, and even a guy like Macy Oteek, right? But those guys proved that wrong. They dominated through incredible on-the-ball pressure, incredible isolation basketball through a lot of ball movement and getting mismatches, through being smart and running good ball screen offense, and from being tough. And then also look at the fact that, you know, Mark Vidal is 6'5", 250, and he had six points and 11 rebounds. And he plays big guy, and that's and he was resilient, right? He, he could have, you know... Falling back, you know, taking not, not taking the role of being a, a scorer on this team. He could have, you know, not been too happy about that. But he didn't sit there and complain and feel bad about himself. No, he he sat there and got better. 
and he and he accepted his role and he was resilient. He's like, I'm going to be the, the really good rebounder. And I'm going to be the the enforcer of this team. That's so cool. That's what college basketball is about, guys. That that that's that's the greatness of college basketball right there. When you have guys who fight through the adversity and fight through difficult situations and fight through through being doubted and stay resilient and get the job done, those are champions. Whether or not Baylor won the championship or not, they were still champions in my book because those guys came from being doubted by top scouts and top schools to being in the fact that now they're national champions. It's just a really cool thing. And you got to take a minute to just be in awe of what's going on there. And the cooler thing too is that it's not just about three-point shooting. It's not just about rebounding. It's the fact that their defense was probably the best on-ball pressure I've seen from a college basketball team this season, at least in the NCAA tournament. They regarded as that. They, they forced you to do turnovers. And that's that's a really good formula for other teams to adopt going forward who are looking to build. Right? Gonzaga is going to be back again. They're getting you know, hopefully some decent recruits. And Mark Few's a great coach. But this is the moment to appreciate Baylor, appreciate their resilience. We'll see a team just overcome the odds, right? Now everyone expected Baylor to be one of the top teams. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that these players overcame being doubted by those schools and scouts and all that kind of stuff to being national champions. That's what college basketball is about, guys. Now we're going to take a quick commercial break here. But when I come back, we're going to talk about the Women's National Championship and talk about a resilient story with Stanford. I'll, I'll get to talking about that. Well, I'm really excited to talk about that. As well as later on the show, we're going to break down Porta Moser to Oklahoma, as well as the idea of players who didn't find success at the first college and now or and found their way to being successful players at a different school and how they stayed resilient through that. So it's going to be really cool to talk all about that stuff when we come back on the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Schredder, and this podcast is brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Thank you again for tuning in to the program. On my last segment, I just talked about the resiliency of Baylor, their incredible national championship run and performance against Gonzaga. And on this segment, I'm going to talk about the same kind of concept, which is basically the idea of resiliency through another national champion. And that was Stanford. Stanford women's basketball just got their third national championship in program history. Tara Vanderver has won her first national championship since 1992. Awesome. Just, it's, it's such a cool thing to see that happen. And again, puts her in competition with, uh, you know, being regarded as one of those great coaches. She already is, but she tied Kim Mul- Mulkey from Baylor, who, Obviously, is an incredible coach. Baylor women's basketball has been really good for a really long time, and she's only behind. And Vanderbilt is only behind the coaches of Pat Summit, who won eight national championships, and Gina Oriema, who won eleven national championships. But I think ultimately, when I look at the Stanford team, I look at another team like Baylor, who overcame major adversity in a different way in order to win this national championship. What do I mean by that? So. Look, guys, right? I think to the, I said it as the beginning of the show. The theme of this show today is the idea of resiliency and overcoming adversity, overcoming the odds, right? 
And teams do that in different ways. People do that in different ways, right? You face different adversity in your life that ultimately results in something and results in teens being successful or not, or do you being successful or not, how you deal with that adversity, how you stay resilient and diligent through all those controversies or areas of struggle you face in your life, right? Or as a team, the struggles you face on the court and maybe the complications of losing games and players getting injured and all this different stuff, right? It's just really an interesting kind of concept to think about. And first off, I want to give a hats off to Arizona women's basketball and they just put an unbelievable show on in the fact that they, they lost 54-53 to to Stanford. And Ari McDonald had an unbelievable tournament. And they won by gritty defense. And they were able to get to the national championship through their gritty defense, beating a team like UConn. They overcame the odds. And they have a great program to build into the future because their identity was based around defense. And they really got the job done there. And they really need their hats off needs to be you know, given to Arizona. They instituted a great defensive game plan. Hats off to them. But I want to look at the fact that Stanford, it's not just about the fact they won that game, right? You look at players like Haley Jones, who was the NCAA tournament best player, right? And you look at Lexi Hall, who performed really good, Cameron Brinks, who I've mentioned earlier, and... It's a really interesting process. It's really interesting to break this stuff down for you guys because when I look at all this stuff, when I look at how these players play, it's really interesting because Stanford had 21 turnovers and still won the game, right? And that just shows you you can't win your best game by playing your best game every time, right? Haley Jones even admitted this; they didn't ever really play their best game in the tournament, but they found a way to stay resilient and win the game. They had multiple double-digit leads that got squashed, and they still were able to hold on, which shows you that diligence and effort can be done in a way that makes things better. Right? And I think that's just the important thing there, too, is that you look at all this stuff and you look at how they got here. It's really interesting because Santa Clara canceled their season on November 28th, right? And that coincided with Stanford's facilities being shut down where Stanford had to practice in high school gyms for 10 weeks and they only had two weeks at of games at home or whatever and they really weren't ever, they were never home they were on the road for the majority of the season and in different areas and and this just shows you that look COVID's been difficult for everyone obviously but I think that the interesting thing about this is just how resilient this team was to not let this affect them right they had to practice in high schools where the lighting sometimes didn't work, right? They had to stay in hotels where those didn't always feel, where their dorm rooms, it didn't feel like comfort for them. But they found a way to find comfort in difficult situations. And look, you have a coach in Tara Vanderver who has 1,125 wins to head coach. So obviously she knows how to win and make anything out of a difficult situation. But for the players, especially with the younger players, to be able to rise up to the occasion, because you know veteran teams can deal with this, right? Baylor, Gonzaga, veteran teams can figure out a way to be successful, right? Baylor was a ve- veteran team that got the job done and were able to overcome that adversity, right? And win the national championship for the men's side. But Stanford's got Haley Jones as a sophomore, Cameron Brinks who's a freshman, Lexi Hull is a junior, right? They don't... They have some senior leadership. I, like, Don't get me wrong, but I'm saying that two of the three best players are underclassmen. And, you know, Kamara Williams, she's also a very great talent as well. But this just goes down to the fact of a few things that I think were really interesting. I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, you worked out in high school gyms. You could not interact with anyone outside the team for 10 weeks, into, 10 weeks starting in December. And... The fact that you were able to, from Stanford to build, you know, to work through that because that's so difficult. When, when you get the number one overall seed and you didn't have easy situations to get there and you weren't at your own home gym, that's just truly remarkable and truly big time to see that happen. And look, I'm going to break down a couple things with this. Right, you look at the championship game. You look at the fact that 
This was a brutal defensive contest, right? But I want to talk about how st- like more about Stanford and then explain how the, this applies to the game because I think you guys will get a more appreciation for how resiliency does really apply to sports in the sense that chemistry was built through Stanford, right? And you could sit there and say, how did they build chemistry when they aren't at their home gym, where they don't have the access to the facilities, when they're on the road, when they have to practice in high school gyms, where they have to travel from hotel to hotel? How do they get that chemistry built? Well, let's think about it, right? The older players would have meetings with the younger players to see how they were dealing with these circumstances and how the older players could make their situations better to fit them into the system correctly. That helped the underclassmen like a Haley Jones, like a Cameron Brinks, be acclimated properly to a really good Stanford culture. And that helped them build chemistry because they can trust their teammates. If you don't trust your teammates, you're not going to be very successful because you don't know what your teammates can do in this situation. You don't know what they're going to do at the defensive end. You don't know what you're going to do late game. Trust needs to be built. Chemistry needs to be built. And they did that through one of that, that kind of stuff. And Brinks also referenced how the idea of the reason they were successful, right? If you have balance on your team, you can trust a lot of people, right? A lot of people can step up because they've been in that situation before because they know what their role is. And if you have a balanced scoring attack, you have a balanced defense, you have balanced key, period, you're just going to be in a better position to be successful. And basketball is always about star players, team concepts, how do your role players fit fit in the in the scheme? Because all these players who go to these top Division One schools can play at a high level. They're all incredible athletes and incredible players. The fact that Stanford was able to use the situation of, well, we don't have our facilities. Well, we can practice in high school gyms. Hey, let's work together. Hey, let's build this chemistry while we're traveling around the road, while we're not in easy situations. Shows you a sense why they won this national championship. I think also the fact that being able to adjust to the bubble – was super easy for them compared to maybe other teams because of their difficult circumstances, right? When you, I'm going to repeat this again, when you aren't able to have your facilities on campus, when you have to go from high school to high school to hotel to hotel, where you don't know how the practice facilities are going to be, where you don't know when your next game's going to be all the time, when you don't know how your season's going to turn out, you're able to adjust to a life where you're sitting in a bubble in a bunch of hotels in San Antonio very well. And... This is why in certain bubble situations, certain teams acclimated better. You look at the younger teams in the bubble in the NBA in 2020, they really acclimate because they didn't have as many things they were caring about, right? They didn't have a family back home. They didn't have different kind of philanthropic deals they had to, you know, do. It's just, it's interesting because if you look at the younger teams, they just went and played and they didn't care. They're like, oh, we're in hotel circumstances. We have to play basketball every day. We're, we're, we're able to get this done. And that's the philosophy that Stanford took as well. Because if you look at Stanford and what they were able to accomplish, they were just saying, well, we've been through a lot worse than this, right? We haven't had a practice facility in a very long time. And we still overcame and we can still overcome this because this is not a big deal. We're playing basketball. We're playing the NCAA tournament. We can make the most out of this. And they even said when the whole idea of the weight room situation occurred right when the men's weight rooms were considerably better than the women's weight rooms to start off the NCAA tournament. They were saying, hey, if we have to lift luggage and books to get it done, we'll do it. Their their mindset was saying, we're going to be resilient through any time of adversity because we've been able to do this all year. And the fact that, look, you never they never played their best in the NCAA tournament and they still got away to win a national championship – what does that come down to? When you're not going to always play your best in the NCAA tournament. You're not going to always have the best game game plan be executed properly. You're not going to be able to always get the, the player to have the, the best game they want to have. But you want to make the big time plays and you want to be resilient down the stretch and you want to make the shots when you have the opportunity. But you also want to make the 50-50 plays. You want to make the toughness plays. You want to fight through the adversity of a game and make and make the right plays to overcome the difficult challenges within a tough game like this, right? That is the interesting process when it comes to basketball itself. And this is why Gino Oriyama has been so successful as a head coach, right? He's taken great talent and they've overcome adversity and they understand how to win and they understand what to do in big moments. Even though they didn't get the job this year done from UConn's perspective, they have a great foundation to build upon. 
Paige Beckers was AP Player of the Year. She was the Wooden Award winner as a freshman. But Stanford's also got a lot to build on as well. Because what Stanford what Stanford can do and what Stanford can develop now is the fact that they have Lexi Hall coming back. They have Haley Jones coming back. They have Cameron Brinks coming back. And you look at all of this. You look at this greatness they have around them. Now, look, Kiana Williams decided to head to the NBA draft. Okay, that's a big loss in the sense that she, well, she had an incredible season, right? And she was the team's leading scorer throughout the season. But they still have the ability, the fact that they fought through COVID. They fought through, you know, being doubted. They fought through difficulties in the bubble. They fought through going from hotel to hotel, high school to high school. This is what basketball's about, guys. This is how champions become made is they have to face some sort of struggle and overcome it and if you do that you can be so it's, it's the same thing in life right it's the same thing in life if you overcome adversity and you overcome it by believing yourself trusting the process trusting your friends and family that you can get it done it, anything could be accomplished in a sense of if if you put your mind to it now, you may not always accomplish your goal, but you, you're working toward that and you're trying to fight through the adversity in order to achieve that goal, right? Life's not easy. And for Stanford, their basketball life this year was very hard, like a lot of our teams, but especially for them because they didn't have the access to their facilities as easily and they, and they didn't have the opportunity to really build something on campus. They had to go from hotel to hotel, the high school to high school to build them, their team and it's tough, especially when you're a younger player coming into that situation. I couldn't imagine what it's like because I didn't get the opportunity to you know, see that at all this season from my perspective. But I, I, I can only imagine what it was like for these women. But they did an unbelievable job, and these players made the most of it. And, and think about it, right? Erin McDonald was a player who dominated, had 26 against UConn. She shot 5 for 21 against Stanford's defense. Now, she did have 22 points. But she had, it was 5 of 21 because Stanford was resilient. They were going to fight to the end, and they were not going to let Ari McDonald beat them. And that's toughness. That's resiliency. That's trusting your team, trusting your coach, trusting your defensive game plan. Because they knew that, that, that Ari McDonald is a fantastic player. They played against her twice already. And they knew Arizona was going to be better than the two times they played against them earlier this season when they blew them out. And this is why Stanford is just... This is what how this happens, right? This is how these champions are made. Because if you are resilient, you can get the job done. Because adversity is always going to strike. It's always going to strike in a game. It's always going to strike in a certain contest. But if you make the most out of the situation, if you make the most out of your opportunities, you can get the job done. It's interesting to think of it that way, right? Because champions ultimately come down to, right, people think, in the NBA, for example, people think, okay, champions come down to, if you have LeBron James on your team, you can do it. Or in the WNBA, oh, if you had Lisa Leslie or Elena Deladon or Sue Bird, you can get the job done. Or Brianna Stewart, oh, you can get the job done. Oh, you just need star talent. Not always true. Yes, you need talented players in order to get the job done. Don't get me wrong, you definitely need that. But you need a good game plan. You need a toughness about you. You need to be able to fight through adversity correctly. And it's and there's never always one simple answer to fight through adversity. You just got to take the positives out of it and make the most of it. And that's what Stanford did. Stanford took the positives out of their difficult situation. They didn't hang their head. They didn't say, oh, our season's going to be tough. We're not going to be able to do it this year. No, they said, you know what? We have all these difficult circumstances. We have COVID. We have you know discrepancies in the weight rooms at the at the bubbles. We have, you know, the ability that we're not being able to play at our facilities. We have all this, these difficult situations. But you know what? We're going to make the most out of it. And they did. They won a national championship. They won a national championship. And look, Stanford's been an incredible women's basketball program for a long, long time. Because Tara Evandiver, as a head coach, is a fantastic coach and a fantastic developer. And like a Kim Mulkey, like a Pat Summit, like a Gina Oriema. These coaches know how to get the job done, obviously, but this is a credit to coaching, yes, because they're able to build this chemistry and build this sense of toughness and positivity through a difficult time. But it's a credit to the upperclassmen making these meetings apparent when these underclassmen are going through the situation. Hey, how can we make this better? Hey, what can we do to make the situation better for you? 
How are we going to build this team properly? Hey, guys, are you fine fitting into this? Does this thing work for you? And look at the way Cameron Brinks played as a freshman this year, right? She's got a great future ahead of her. And she averaged around 10 points a game this year because she was able to buy in and do a fitter role and emerge when they needed her to emerge. And, and think about that, right? That's not just coaching. That's people believing in her and her having belief in herself because of the way the culture is around her. Good teams, good team cultures to, are, are so important in college basketball, so important, and especially because adversity in college basketball and any kind of sport always happens, right? You're going to lose a couple games in a row. You're going to have you know pauses in your season if you have a, like a COVID situation this year, right? You may have an injury, right? You may have the media criticizing certain players on your team for their play. But if you're resilient, if you've got a good culture, you are looking at the positive side of things, anything can, can be done in that season to overcome those tough situations during a season. And I think it's just great for women's basketball. I think it's great for Tara Vanderberg because she hasn't won a national championship since 1992. And, man, that's a long time. That's a long time. It's 29 years. So that's a, that's a very difficult situation, obviously. But she was able to get the job done. And it wasn't just her, right? Her players overcame. They overcame, for example, having double-digit leads and losing them, right? They overcame struggling from the field offensively. They, they overcame the fact that Keanu Williams did not play great in the last two games of the season. But Haley Jones stepped up. Lexi Hull stepped up. Cameron Brinks stepped up. This is what happens. Sometimes your best player is not going to play their best. They're going to be the defensive focus of every team, right? This is the reason why Keanu Williams is trying to go to the uh, WNBA draft. And she's got a great chance to have a good career in that league, right? But other players got to step up, and they did because they were resilient, because they believed in each other, because this, the, the system that was established at Stanford was designed for success because Tara Vandiver is a great coach and the players know what she needs and how they're going to be successful. This is the truly great thing about this whole story. And I think it just, it's what makes college basketball so fun because you see these, these teams have this unbelievable success and had to fight through all this adversity. I'm telling you Stanford story is one of the cooler stories you'll you'll ever see. And the fact that they had to go through all these different struggles and, and the fact that they had to go through the bubble and how they had to do all these different kinds of situations in order to be successful. That's what's so cool about this. And that's what's so cool about them winning this national championship is because they overcame so much struggle and so much difficult situations and consequences of not being able to play because of Santa Clara's shutting down contact sports in November and then in December. And for young players, that's difficult. But if you have a good upperclassman culture, if you have a positive culture, if you have a good culture already established, you can bring young players in and they can buy in even if the situation doesn't seem easy to accept. You know, you're a college team, you have all the great athletic so it is, but COVID makes things difficult, obviously, right? We've seen it all around sports and around the world just generally. But they took the better path of positivity, and they made the most out of it, and that is what resulted in a national championship for this team. And it's just truly a remarkable thing. And I'm really just it's, – it's so great to see Tara, Coach Vanderver get the opportunity to win our national championship, to put her among those greats. And she already has been among those greats, but that – tie Kim Mulkey with national championships and to continue to build on the success at Stanford is just truly remarkable. We're going to take a quick commercial break here, but when I come back, we're going to talk about former Loyola Chicago head coach Porter Moser going to Oklahoma, what that means for the Sooners basketball program. And then later on, we're going to talk about the great journeys of players that didn't have success initially in college basketball, but ultimately found greater success after they stayed diligent and resilient. So, We'll be back shortly with those segments. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. 
There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Schredder, and this podcast is brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. My last segment, I broke down the incredible resiliency of the Stanford women's basketball program to go through all they went through in order to win a national championship. Truly a remarkable story, and it just shows how resiliency plays in a lot of different fashions in championship runs and just in sports in general and in life in general, which is a really cool thing to see. And I think when you think of resiliency too, you think of Cinderella's overcoming the odds, right? And Loyal Chicago has been one of those teams, right? You have them making the Final Four in 2018 as an 11 seed. They made the Sweet 16 this season. And it's pretty impressive what they've been able to do, right? It's been really impressive how the program's been built, how they've been able to be really good defensively, really tough, really smart players, and execute really well offensively where they don't have to rely on a ton of iso ball in order to win. And Porter Moser has really ingrained a really good culture at that school. And just the other day, it was announced that Porter Moser is now going to be the new head coach at Oklahoma. And this is the big school weight that he's been looking for. He said he really liked the culture there. He felt that it could fit his style the best because he got offered jobs from St. John's in the past after that run in 2018, but turned it down. And it's going to be interesting. Now, Drew Valentine, the older brother of Denzel Valentine, who plays for the Chicago Bulls in the NBA, is going to be the new head coach at Loyola Chicago. And... He was a, you know, Valentine's been an assistant at Loyola the past four years, and I think will be a, a fine coach because he was under Porter Moser's system. He understands the game and everything like that. But this is going to be a, an interesting move for Oklahoma. Obviously, this is uh, coming off the early exit of Lon Kruger. Um, when I mean early exit, I mean like early after the whole season's done, and it was pretty quick that Lon Kruger decided to step away from the program and not coach him this year and Lon Kruger's a legend obviously if you guys follow college basketball Lon Kruger is a fantastic coach really built a good program at Oklahoma and obviously will be missed but I think Porter Moser's a very good hire because of what Porter Moser brings is he's going to bring a defensive intensity that I think Oklahoma desperately needs not saying that Lon Kruger did not coach a good defensive team because he was a good defensive coach for sure they had years where they were a top defensive team in the Big 12 and everything like that but I think if you look at Oklahoma's teams in the past, they rely on a lot on iso ball, and they struggled against teams who ran good offenses. Let's look at, for example, Gonzaga this year, who scored a lot of points on them very easily. Now, Oklahoma this year was a good defensive team, but they weren't a top-end defensive team. Loyola Chicago was the fourth-best defensive team in the country and had 330 possible qualifying schools. And that's a credit to Porter Moser. Right, he has a just to give you a little bit of a resume to understand what Oklahoma is going to be getting in this guy. He's two ninety three and two forty one as an overall head coach. He was one eighty three and one forty at Loyal Chicago, and then he also had a fifty four and thirty four record at Arkansas Little Rock. Um, 
But unfortunately, he ha- he did have a little bit of a blemish in- on his second trip. Um, and if you look at what I think he's going to bring, I think if you look at the possibility of him bringing a really good defensive competitive nature to these teams. And when I, when I think about this, when I think about his opportunities and the fact that he can really coach at a high level, right? Let, let's let, So the thing is, when I look at him, right, he had success at Loyola Chicago, got them to a Final Four, got them to a Sweet 16, and they, fin- and they had five 20-win seasons, uh, which is the most in the school's history. He has a 6-2 and two NCAA tournament record, and he was a 2018 Missouri Valley Conference of the uh, head coach of the year in the conference. Now, he did have a, a blemish in his record at Illinois State where he was below 500 as a head coach. But the fact that he was able to redeem himself and do really well at Loyola Chicago shows, again, a level of resiliency. And I think when you look at coaches like this, coaches that are defensive-minded, I think that he actually fits really well because what he can do is he can take the talented players of Oklahoma and have them buy into ball movement and get really easy opportunities out of a lot of different handoffs and back cuts where these elite level players who can go more isolation ball get easier opportunities through all, through all the ball movement. Now, Loyola Chicago is not an extremely great offensive team. Even when they beat Illinois in the round of 32 this year, it wasn't through their offense. It was because they could make plays when they had to, but it was really their defense. And I think for Oklahoma's standpoint, He's going to bring a really good defensive intensity. That even though Lon Kruger was a f- very good defensive coach, there's no one quite like the. <laughs> there's no, no one quite like Porter Moser's energy and defense when it comes to that. Because Porter Moser coached the fourth ranked defense in, in the country, and they were number one in points per game. So when I look at that, it's going to be really important. Because especially in the Big Twelve, everyone understands this, right? The Big Twelve was regarded as, as the top two conference in the country this year. The championship team was from the Big 12, which tells you a lot about the conference. And I think that he's going to be a good addition. I think that Lon Kruger is obviously a very good coach. You know, Lon Kruger left a huge imprint on the program, coaching very talented players like a Blake Griffin, like a Trey Young, and Austin Reeves as well this year. And I, And it just shows you again, right? that it's going to be interesting to see how it all unfolds, obviously, because when you you have to adjust to recruiting in a different kind of landscape and the type of players you're going to get in, and you have to beat out the other Big 12 schools for the top recruits. But I think Moser is really a focus on the guys that are going to fit his, his culture and his style the best. And, and Grant, that's how coaches look at these type of recruiting things, right? They, they want to get guys who fit their style, fit their – their mesh, in a sense, right, fit the fit the uh, the whole mold properly, and it's interesting because Moser is not really known a guy who really would jump on an opportunity like this. But I think the fact that he likes the culture of Oklahoma a lot was, I think, the big reason why. And and you know, getting a a big school opportunity is never necessarily a bad move if you're trying to you know upstart your career in a sense, but. He could have definitely built the dynasty of Loyola Chicago. I mean, he had that team really trending in the right direction. And the whole drama of with that with Sister Jean, who's 101 years old, and the whole miracle of the, this team getting to an Final Four this year and being able to beat some of the teams that were national championship favorites like Illinois this year. And it, it just shows you again that resiliency is super important, right? Porter Moser could have sat there after his Illinois State job and said, you know, maybe I don't have this in me to be a good coach. Completely opposite of what he thought. Because he went to Loyola Chicago and built a program where they had five 20-win seasons, where he was 6-2 and two in the NCAA tournament, where they beat Illinois in this year's tournament, where they made the Final Four in 2018, and also had an opportunity to build a great dynasty. He built a really good program there at, at Loyal Chicago. Since where people are going to look at that school and say, yeah, that's a really good program. And you look at players like Crutwig, Cameron Crutwig, and, and um, Williamson from um, Loyal Chicago, and 
even looking at Clayton Custer in 2018, these players embodied him because they bought into him because they believed in what he brought to the table. And he developed this because, look, he's got great energy. He's got great passion for the game, obviously. Because think about it, guys, right? If you have an opportunity to go to a Big 12 school when you're in a smaller conference and run the same kind of system you can and try to win a national championship, a lot of coaches and I think a lot of people would take that opportunity because it just gets better pay and also you're playing in more nationally showcased games. Some guys wouldn't take that because some guys like to build the little guy into a big program. Look at Mark Few, right? Gonzaga was a mid-major and then became a high-major conference type team through Mark Few's development and through his patience and all that kind of stuff. And Porter Moser's got a great chance to be a good coach there. I think he, look, everyone knows he already is a good coach because he took a team that no one expected to get to the Final Four or Sweet 16 and got them over the hump and got them the opportunity to play in those big games and beat really quality teams. And I think when you look at this, this is going to be an interesting move, right? Because he has more pressure to win now than he did probably at Loyola Chicago because the Big 12 is a much more demanding conference in terms of winning. Oklahoma is a, a good program within that conference. They make the NCAA tournament a lot and they develop a lot of great talent or, and get a lot of great talent in recruiting. So my thought process is kind of the sense of what does he bring, right? He brings a defensive presence. He brings a, a guy who's tough, who's going to have his team fight through adversity, right? And think about him, right? Arkansas Little Rock, right? After he weighed a lot in the assistant coaching ranks, Arkansas Little Rock, he and even when you know when he played at Creighton, right? He didn't always, he didn't get a, a ton of star talent or star minutes at Creighton, right? He he could have hung his head and not felt great about that, but no, he he decided to become an assistant coach, get into coaching, got his stint at Arkansas Little Rock, was able to kind of develop a good culture there, a good team. Went to Illinois State where that didn't really work out very well, and he, look, he could have hung his head saying. Look, maybe coaching's not for me. I'm not. I wasn't very successful at a, a higher ranked program at Illinois State. I wasn't able to lift them over the top, and that is not what he did. What he did is he got this team to be able to play winning basketball. What he did at Loyal Chicago is got this team to buy into playing really stout defense, to be able to move the ball, to be able to trust one another, to believe in one another, and. What their basketball was was different than a lot of other college teams because college teams usually generally have a guy they can give the ball to and have him go isolation. That would, and even Gonzaga, right? Gonzaga, they could go isolation with Suggs. They could go isolation with Tinney in the post. They ran through Cameron Crutwig and who could go isolation in the post, but it was through a lot of ball movement, right? A lot of the stuff was back cuts and ball screens and flare screens and handoffs and pick and rolls and you know, ex, you know, finding the extra man. And then defensively, right, it was aggressive corrals on ball screens to forcing a lot of mid-range jump shots, good transition defense to, you know, forcing guys to shoot over a contested hand to have major help. That is all a development of when you don't have the talented players like teams like an Illinois do or a Michigan do or a North Carolina or a Duke, right? He had to develop those kind of players. And it's interesting because he wants to establish that same kind of process and system at Oklahoma. And I think the thing that's interesting about that, in my opinion, is that he has a greater opportunity to recruit higher level recruits. And he can get these guys to buy into his system. And also they're going to be more athletic on on the perimeter so they could be even better defensively. And offensively, he has more opportunity. Yes, he can run that motion offense and run all these pick and rolls. But they get a great opportunity to get these guys to develop and move the ball and get in really favorable offensive positions because Oklahoma's going to naturally have higher recruited guys than a loyal Chicago because they're a, in a power five conference. It's just how it works. And it'll be interesting because I think that what he'll bring is a really different defensive presence. Juan Kruger obviously was, was good defensively. Oklahoma had a great defensive, you know, games where they beat Alabama based on really good defense and, and when I look at this too, and it's it's interesting, obviously, because they beat Kansas based on that too, because they did play good defense when they had to. But number four in the country in defensive efficiency is different. Even though Long Kruger, Long Kruger was probably a 
like the, the teams always scored more points under him than Porter Moser. But Porter Moser was a, a team, a guy who grinded teams out from the defensive angle and using the losing the clock up, running good, efficient offense. That will be interesting because he didn't really play very fast at Loyola Chicago, and Oklahoma has played very fast up and down type of games under Long Kruger. So it'll be interesting to see how that adjustment happens. So how I think he should be doing this is honestly, he should keep doing what he's doing, but also be willing to play a little bit faster. Because I think with Oklahoma, you have greater athletes. Well, not necessarily greater athletes, but more talented players that you can mold into your system. But you can also let them play fast and play slow and play through structure. And you can. And the thing, the thing with him is he's letting them buy into defense, right? You look at a guy like Nate Oates, right? Nate Oates is a fantastic coach at Alabama. He gave the guys a lot of freedom offensively and demanded a lot on the defensive end. And Alabama was one of the best defensive teams in the country this year. But I know Porter, Porter Moser is very different. And I think Porter Moser is going to probably get guys who are athletic but buy into a very good motion-based offense and then demand a lot on the defensive end. And I think, especially in the Big 12, when you're playing teams like Texas, Kansas, Baylor, Texas Tech, and you go down the line, Oklahoma State, there's a lot of opportunity for success, obviously. But I think that when you ultimately look at these teams, right, they're very talented. And you've got to have a really good defensive identity. You've got to have an identity to be successful as a team. I was listening to Dwayne Wade talk about the Boston Celtics. And he said that the problem with that he sees with them is they don't have an identity. Well, Loyal Chicago under Porter Moser had an identity of being a resilient team, a tough team, and living through their defense. And what has led them to get to overcome adversity, when Illinois made runs on them, they were resilient enough on the defensive end, and offensively they trusted the ball movement and the motion offense to get the ball into Crutwick at the high post, let him run his dribble handoffs, let him see backdoor cuts, and allow the center to operate as the point guard. And I think that's, that was a really interesting process and an interesting move. It's because Porter Moser has been resilient. He's willing to change his 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 scheme to fit the team, and I think he's always going to be big on defense, and I think he's always going to be big on toughness and resiliency. And, and that's one reason I, I grouped him into this podcast today is because it's not just the, the fact that his hire, I think, is going to be an interesting hire um, and a good hire, I think, for Oklahoma after they lost Long Kruger, but it's because of the idea of resiliency, right? And I think resiliency is something that we saw, right? Baylor had resiliency through the doubters and through all the transfers coming in and having to adjust to that. Stanford had resiliency through all the different changes they had in terms of their, where they where they played, where they stayed, how their team was constructed, and how their situations were in the different San Antonio bubble uh, circumstances and all that kind of stuff. And Porter Moser is a great example of resiliency because his teams had to overcome adversity in order to get into the tournament. They had to win their conference. And then they, they would come in and when the top teams would – overlook them they would be resilient enough to withstand those teams runs play great defense play together and I think he's going to bring that to Oklahoma and I think that that that's going to help Oklahoma definitely in that regard be a resilient team be a tough defensive team even tougher than they were with Long Kruger and you and again they were a good defensive team but they played at a faster pace and it'll be interesting to see if they play at a fast pace with Porter Moser but I think what they'll do is they'll have a top 10 defense in the country with him because He'll ingrain a, a system that works, and he demands a lot out of you, which is good. Like a lot of these players are going from Lon Kruger to Porter Moser, two high demanding coaches, and two guys who care very much about the players, and two resilient individuals. So I think that this is a hire that if you're an Oklahoma player, you should be happy about in the sense of if you can't have Lon Kruger, you're getting a guy who's just as passionate and just as ingrained in defense as he is. And even maybe even more so, and a guy that's also just resilient, a guy that has learned from his past mistakes from winning and losing as a coach, a guy who took a low major slash mid major school to a Final Four and a Sweet Sixteen, and having a six and two NCAA tournament record, and having five twenty points, sorry twenty win seasons at a school where basketball wasn't as huge until he got there. So if you can take a program that no one knows that much about and make them a mid-major and make them talked about, that, that's resiliency. That means you understand from what they need that you can understand how to bring toughness into them. And think about it, right? Baylor brought a lot of toughness to the, to the plate. Stanford women's basketball brought a lot of toughness to the plate. And that's why Porter Moser could be a really good addition to Oklahoma is because he can ingrain that sense of 
belief and discipline that a lot of teams sometimes don't have when they when they're highly ranked recruits. And Lon Kruger did that because Lon Kruger has been there a long time. But Porter Moses has been around this enough, and he's resilient enough in terms of fighting through his own adversity and having the teens fight through adversity and staying positive and you know good through the storm in a sense, right? There's a sense of being calm through the storm. He's a very passionate coach, but he gets the guys through those struggles by having them go on runs through a belief, through believing in each other, right? And having a great defense and trusting the offense around them and trusting his system and trusting each other, right? That's the confidence he's going to bring to these talented players. And especially in a conference like the Big 12, it's going to be really exciting to see what he can bring to the table and what he can establish at this program. And I, I'm, I'm excited for it because it's always interesting to see how a new coach leaving a school where he established a really good reputation can do at a big-time school and what he can do. So if you think about resiliency, right, players are resilient, obviously, but the coaches that are able to have success, then struggle at a period of their time, and then overcome that and become successful again and ingrain some sort of system and have the players buy into that is a level of resiliency that needs to be adapted and understood if you if people want to be successful, right? Resiliency is is and being diligent in times where there's adversity and just times even when they're not is what allows success to be made. And for Porter Moser, that's why he's been a successful head coach, and that's why he got hired at Oklahoma. And it'll be interesting to see how that all goes. We're going to take a quick commercial break here, but when I come back, we're going to talk about different players who overcame adversity and use resilience to really make themselves into a lot better players than they were maybe initially when they went to college. All that coming back up shortly. Searching your vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Schredder. This podcast is brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Thank you again for tuning in to the program. We really appreciate you tuning in and listening to my podcast here today. My last segment just talked about, again, the Oklahoma head coach, Porter Moser, the new hiring of him, and the fact that he has shown resiliency in order to get this job, build a successful program out of Loyola Chicago, and that he's going to try and ingrain that into a Oklahoma team that plays in a really difficult Big 12 conference. And this is going to be the interesting thing, obviously, about it, is that we look at all that kind of stuff and we base everything off of like how adversity is made and how you overcome it, right? And I, I'm looking at players who have maybe transferred from different schools and, and used that adversity when they're doubted and made success out of it. I think it's really unique, right? If you think about the, the different maybe players in the NBA, for example, who've done this, right? DeMontis Sabonis goes from OKC to Indiana and becomes an all-star through his diligence, through his hard work, through finding the right culture that fit him. And that's the interesting thing about that too. But I want to talk about some guys who transferred from certain schools who are current players in college and have found success through different ways of that. So let's start off with Johnny Juzang, right? I think the guy who exploded in the tournament showed unbelievable game and unbelievable toughness and unbelievable skill. And again, he averaged almost 23 points a game in the NCAA tournament. He had 29 points against Gonzaga, 28 points against Michigan. He basically helped carry the UCLA Bruins as an 11th seed to the Final Four. And yes, you can credit Mick Cronin with a lot of that success, and I and I agree with you. But Johnny Juzang 
man, he, he was a really tough player, and he, he showed a lot of great skill in the ISO situations, being able to create his own shot because he came into college as just a shooter, and he became a complete scorer at UCLA, which I think really elevated him and a chance for him to get drafted because of all this momentum and maybe get a good draft pick in that regard. But let's talk about where he was originally, right? He he uh, he, he came from Kentucky, and you know Kentucky's a program where a lot of these top recruits go and become one and dones under Calipari because Calipari understands the NBA game so well, and these guys are just talented enough to become one and dones. But Johnny Juzang, it didn't really work out for him a whole ton there, and he didn't really find his way, and that, that happens, right? But he transferred. And he stayed diligent in who he was and who he was as a player. Went to UCLA. And after Chris Smith, the team's leading scorer, got injured, Johnny Juzang took up the mantle and became the team's leading scorer, averaging 15 half points in the regular season. And as a result of that, he gets to the NCAA tournament and just purely dominates, right? He has the green light to do what he needs to do. He takes over games. He takes the shots he wants to take. He's their closer at the end of the games. They go to him for a bucket. And... It's all about the fact that he was resilient, right? He could have went to Kentucky, not played a whole ton, right? Not found his way and, again, felt bad and had self-doubt and didn't think maybe he could do it. But that's not what he did, right? He found UCLA and he he found the best thing out of that situation. And, look, the transfer portal is obviously becoming huge in this offseason. And... You know, that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm more talking about the fact that John and Juzang and these players have shown a level of resiliency. And think about it, right? You go to Kentucky, one of the best programs of blue blood in college basketball, and it doesn't work out for you, right? That happens. But then he stays diligent. He's like, okay, well, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go play at a high level, and I'm going to go to UCLA, find the way for Mick Cronin to develop me into a pure scorer. And that happened. And now he's like a guy that, might be a first round draft pick and I think he should be and has a chance of leading for the NBA this season and that's because of his diligence that's because of his resiliency not taking no for an answer fighting through that adversity of self-doubt and whether or not he could play at that college level at a high level and becoming a guy who the NCAA tournament who everyone knew about and was an all tournament team and again a guy who's you know just an unbelievable player a guy who's a you know a Pac-12 all Pac-12 type of talent. And this is all because of his work ethic. It's because he was resilient. It's because he didn't take no for that no for an answer. And it's because he believed in himself. And he believed the coaching staff could get him there. And that's really hard for a lot of players to do. And it's, it's really hard for a lot of people to do, right? To figure out situations where you can become better and achieve greatness. And that's the whole thing about that. It's like he really elevated his game because of his resiliency. And I think that's really unique and really cool about how he's able to do that. Second player I want to look at is, is um, well, the second players I want to look at is the entire Baylor transfer. And we'll start with Jared Butler, who became an All-American this year. He was an All-American last year. He transferred in from Alabama, played three years at Baylor, and was an All-American for two of them. And he won the national championship this year. He was the best player in that game. And after being, you know, look, a top 100 recruit, four-star recruit, went to Alabama, and Avery Johnson was no longer the coach, and he couldn't coach, and he couldn't, and he didn't play there. He could have went to, you know, he he could have been like, oh man, like where am I going to figure this out? Am I going to be able to play and that kind of stuff? But no, he stayed resilient. He stayed diligent. He found Baylor. He worked his tail off, and he became an All American in two years. Um, in two of his three years, he was there. He was an All American. That was because of his work ethic. That's because he was resilient. It's because he believed in himself. It's because Scott Drew believed in him. And when you work hard, when you overcome adversity it's through hard work it's through belief and that's what Jared Butler did and that's what guys like Davion Mitchell did right Davion Mitchell was I think the glue well the Mark Vidal you might say is a glue of Baylor but Davion Mitchell was the disruptor right he's a guy who also conducted everything offensively but was the disruptor on the defensive end and he came from Auburn right he got recruited highly to Auburn didn't work out because Jared Harper is now in the NBA was playing above him he transfers to Baylor and becomes an All-American type player his senior year. And that's because of the fact that he was a really good scorer if he had to be. It's because of his hard work. It's because of his diligence. And again, it was resiliency. That's the theme of today's podcast. And it's a perfect example with these players. Maceo Teague, right, coming from UNC Asheville, where he was the big South 
freshman of the year. He could have stayed there and had an unbelievable career, but he's like, no, I want something greater. And people doubt him, right? He was not the highest ranked recruit. He was not the uh, guy who was recruited at the highest school. But he said, you know what? I'm good enough to play at Baylor, and I'm good enough to compete in the Big 12. And he stayed resilient through the adversity of maybe getting doubted by certain people and the struggles of maybe trying to do that adjustment. And he made the most out of it. And that's important. He made the most out of that opportunity. And as a result of that, as a result of that resiliency, as a result of being able to fight through that, him and Davion Mitchell became guys who dominated in the NCAA tournament and dominated the season. Look at them against Gonzaga. Gonzaga had no answer for both of those guys because those guys worked on their games. They were they fought through that adversity of you know COVID protocols, of transferring in, of finding their niche and finding where they stand on this team. And they became huge catalysts in an NCAA tournament championship run. And I think when he, again, I'm going to harp this a lot and I may be repeating myself, but that's fine. The idea of resiliency is resiliency creates winners. If you're resilient, you're going to be a winner. And maybe not necessarily you're going to be a national champion or maybe like the highest person in your job, but you're going to find success because you're going to be able to weather storms and overcome adversity, which is so important, not just in sports, but in life. We can also look at guys like Adam Flagler, right? He came from Presbyterian, and he's a key bench guy who came in, made a great difference off the bench, made a great scoring punch off the bench with Matthew Meyer. And look, after Presbyterian, he could have stayed at Presbyterian, but he's like, you know what? No, I'm, I'm destined for greater things. I'm going to go to Baylor. I'm going to be a part of this team. And he, is, and he did a great job off the bench, and that was through his resiliency, overcoming the adversity of transferring. Right? It's not easy to transfer into a big school where you come from a small school because you have a lot to prove. And the fact that he came in, he, he, he played it to his best and everything like that, worked out and it made him better. You can also look at Jonathan uh, Chabachachua, right? Goes for UNLV. That doesn't work out. He doesn't get a lot of playing time. Goes to Baylor and becomes an instrumental piece off the bench. A guy who can defend, a guy who can rebound, a guy who can catch lobs off pick and rolls. He was a key piece to them. And it, again, he was a big piece defensively on guys like Drew Timmy from Gonzaga. And if he wasn't resilient and diligent in his work and didn't believe in himself, maybe that would never have happened. And it, But it did happen because he had those attributes and had those traits. Let's take another example. Javon Quinterly, right? Everyone knew him as this highlight reel type player for New Jersey. And I've talked about him before, right? He's the, he was a second leading scorer in Alabama this year. It didn't work out for him at Villanova. He didn't quite fit that system. It didn't quite fit his game. But he stayed patient. He stayed resilient. He's like, you know what? Alabama under Nate Oates works for me. And he could have went in. People were doubting him. Like, can he shoot? Is, is he really that good? Like, was he worth a McDonald's All-American? He put that all out, out of his head, and he worked his tail off. And he got really good. And he became a huge piece on a really good Alabama team that won the SEC regular season and won the SEC tournament. And... That was all because of his resiliency, right? And his belief. If he didn't believe in himself, and he didn't believe that he could get there, he, he may not have been as, as successful as he was at Alabama. But he worked on his game. He believed in himself. And he overcame that adversity and that self-doubt and the doubters out there that didn't think he was good enough. And he proved all those guys wrong. And it's always great to see those stories. When you overcome the odds and when you prove someone wrong, it, it's definitely a great feeling for a lot of these players because they, they have so much pressure on them even as college at overcome that but I think when you look at Javon Quinley and what he was able to accomplish it was because of the resiliency it was because of hard work and it was because he believed in himself and Nate Oates had a belief in him that he could work well within this team and as a scoring punch off the bench it worked out really well in his favor but when I also look at really good transfers that made a huge contribution to their team I think of two guys who kind of changed their roles in a sense to help the team be better, right? I'm going to look at Andrew Nemhard, who played for Gonzaga this year, who was a former player at Florida, and Mike Smith, who was a former Columbia basketball player and one of the best scorers in the country when he was there. And then he became the point guard at Michigan and completely changed his role. Starting with Andrew Nemhard, if you look at Andrew Nemhard, he's a guy that averaged 9.2 points a game this year, which is a drop from 11 points a year ago at Florida. He became a guy who was a facilitator, who made you know hit open shots when he had to make you know scoring options when he w- w- was required to run the offense efficiently move the ball make shots when he when he had to be big time and ultimately when i look at all this stuff when i look at 
what he had to accomplish, what he did. I think of the fact that Andrew Nemhard really fit a really good role at Gonzaga. He was instrumental in building the, the most efficient offense in the country this year. And that's because he was resilient. He overcame the adversity. People were like, oh, is he really going to fit at Gonzaga? Can he really play at that level um, and start at that level? But the thing is, what's interesting about this, what's interesting about the way he played is that he fitted and he exceeded expectations. And he was such a key piece for this team. And look, they, they, they could have been very successful with Drew Timmy, Corey Kispert, Jalen Suggs, and Joel Ayayi. But they needed Namar because they needed a guy who could be that really good glue guy and utility guy. Like you can say Ayayi was that too, but Andrew Nemhar could hit big shots. He can make big defensive steals. He can make a big pass. He was really good at understanding how to run the pick and roll, especially if Suggs was getting trapped and double teamed. He could play as that off guard and do a really good job keeping the offense calm and playing at that fast place, but playing under control. And if he wasn't resilient, he didn't work hard and he didn't understand and he didn't work with Mark Few to understand how to fit that role to, to the best ability. He never would have been in the position to be as successful as he was this season, right? Think about it, right? If you don't work hard and you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to ever achieve what you want to achieve and reach your full potential. And then when I look at Mike Smith, Mike Smith was a guy who was a unbelievable scorer at Columbia, right? Unbelievable. And a very talented Columbia team on a team that plays in the Ivy League, which is a tough conference and everything like that, right? But he goes to Michigan and, you know, that's a leg up, obviously, right? The Big Ten and everything like that, right? And People were saying, like, can he adjust and go to be a facilitator role, right? And there was doubt in that sense, but he proved all those people wrong, right? Oh, can he start? Well, he started, and he was a big-time piece for Michigan because he could get in the lane and facilitate to the open shooters. He made things easy for Hunter Dickinson on pick and rolls. He bought into what Jawan Howard wanted him to do in terms of being a nat defensively and being an excellent floor general. And if, he, and if he wasn't resilient to overcome the adversity of people saying, you know, that he was a scorer and not necessarily a facilitator, and can he, br- you know, bring that to the table? He, he maybe he would never have been as good. But he, but he blocked all that out. All that out. He worked hard on being that in that role and, and working hard in his craft. And he was an exceptional player for them. And he was a huge piece. If they didn't have the point guard role, maybe Michigan would not have been as good as they they were because he was so quick at getting in the lane and then especially because he's a little bit smaller than six feet, he understood that he could kick out the shooters, understood how to be smart and dump off to Hunter Dickinson or or um, any of the bigs playing in the game, like Brandon Johns or you know, and Isaiah Livers and those guys, right? He understood how to get the shooters involved. He understood how to run the offense correctly. And if he wasn't resilient, he didn't accept that role. He didn't work hard that role. He didn't overcome the doubters saying what he had to say. He never would have gotten to that level. He probably would have still got to that level because of his work ethic, but like, his, his work ethic and buying in and understanding that role and being resilient to overcome the adversity during the season, especially because Michigan had COVID pauses and he stayed within that role. He understood how he had to, he had to be that leader of the team and get the guys to buy in. And that's what really helped Michigan be such a su- successful team. And that's what allowed him to have such a, such a successful role on that team. And that's just another example of like, you know, Maybe you go from a situation where you were the man to going on a team where you have to fit a different role. But if you're resilient, you're tough, you, you, you have that diligence about you to work hard and overcome the uh, difficulties of changing a role and overcome the difficulties of the season and everything like that and become a really big piece. It shows you that resiliency and hard work really pay off at the end of the day and make guys successful. And that's super important when you think of college basketball. You think of basketball generally, think of sports, right? If Tom Brady never believed himself when he was a six round draft pick that he could be a great quarterback he may never have been one right he never would have put that work ethic in he never would have put that great studying in and watching all that film he never would have put all the pliability training and the mental work and all that kind of stuff to become a great player lebron james is the same way right kevin durant same way michael jordan right all these guys had a resilient attitude and a hard working attitude that allowed them to become the players they are and Mike Smith was able to take on that role because he worked so hard to be an incredible scorer at Columbia, but he worked really hard in Michigan to become the ultimate point guard that could really lead a team to a Elite Eight National Championship type deal. And Michigan was two points away from winning an Elite Eight and getting into the Final Four. So hats off to him for his resiliency and his hard work. And that's just another example of why it's so important. 
And then you can even look at guys like Marcus Carr, right, who was one of the best scorers in the Big Ten this year. A guy that at Pittsburgh was was good, but wanted to take a step up and become even better. And he was resilient. He worked really hard on it with Rick Fertino, and he got better. And he became an elite level scorer. And that was because he believed in himself. He was he was, overcame the adversity. Like he would have bad games, and he'd come back out and play better. And if he didn't believe that he could be successful at the Big Ten level, he never would have been in that situation. If he never knew, never was resilient in overcoming that adversity, maybe he would never have been there, right? And that's the case with all these different guys. They start from a certain place, and they they go through tough times. Maybe not fitting initially at their at their school, or trying to take on a bigger challenge than they initially took at their previous school and having the doubters with that, maybe the self-doubt creeps in, right? But that self-doubt never crept in for them because they had that ability to overcome adversity, right? They had that resiliency. They had that toughness. They had that determination to be great, to help the team win. And if you look at players like a Johnny Juzang, right? If, if he didn't believe that he could be the star of UCLA, he never would have had the run he did. If, if he didn't have the belief that he could take over games, he never would have done that. And you look at guys like Jared Butler, right? Same kind of deal, right? Jared Butler is going to be an NBA draft pick type of guy. Davion Mitchell's got a chance there too because these guys believed in themselves, right? And, that, and you know, Javon Quinley did too and Andrew Nemhard and Mike Smith, right? And Marcus Carr and Macy Oteague, right? These guys never would have gotten to the level without being resilient and working hard and believing in themselves. And that's the theme. And that's why resiliency is so important in sports, guys, because – if you have, if you're resilient, right? If you, if you, you know, understand how these players can get to a certain level, they can be successful, right? And look, maybe every situation is different, right? You can, you know, have a bad first year and you can figure it out. And but some guys, you know, that they, they they decide to transfer and they figure it out and they become better players for it. And that's why resiliency is so important in sports, right? You have to be resilient. You have to overcome the adversity. And it's the same thing with life, right? Life's going to throw curveballs at you. How do you respond? And I think that these players responded in a positive way. They responded by working hard, by saying, I'm going to be resilient. I'm going to overcome this adversity. I'm going to overcome this challenge in front of me. I'm going to conquer it. And you look at all these different players, right? In, in different ways, they overcame that, that those obstacles and those challenges. And by doing so, they became better players. They helped their teams be more successful than they probably would have been. And the majority of these players, right, either played in a Sweet 16, Elite 8, or a national championship, right? Marcus Carr is the only one who did it, but Marcus Carr had a great year, and he helped Minnesota to stay relevant in the Big Ten. And at one point, Minnesota was a top 15 team in the country because of his great success. So that, th- th- these stories are just truly remarkable, and it shows you how important resiliency is in sports. That's going to wrap up our show here. Thank you so much for tuning into the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Please uh, give us a like on Twitter and Facebook. Subscribe to us on the different podcast platforms that you listen to. And we really appreciate you listening to the platform. This is Michael Schredder, and this is the GSMC Basketball. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.